like not a completely evil practice by any means, but that underneath it all, the primary driving factor was greed. And I knew that when I grew up, I didn't want that to be the primary thing that drove my time, like for my entire adult life, 40 hours a week. So welcome to the Meaningful Jobs podcast season two. Uh, I'm your host, Adrian, and today we are extremely grateful to be able to invite Deirdre to the podcast. Hi, Deirdre, how are you? Hi, I'm well. Thanks for having me. So um, Deirdre is now working in event asset uh, management, management, but her story is very, very interesting because I believe um, you you know, worked in NGOs before, um, before you're moving into the corporate world and you didn't go straight into finance. So yeah, could you give us a brief, you know, overview about, you know, how you got to where you are? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a child of the eighties, as they say. And when I was growing up, um, you know, we had a particular vision of business. There was this whole famous Gordon Gecko speech where he talked about how greed is good. Gordon Gecko was a Mm -hmm. movie character. And that was kind of the impression that I have of business, that business was, you know, provided people with goods and services, right? Like not a completely evil practice by any means, but that underneath it all, the primary driving factor was greed. And I knew that when I grew up, I didn't want that to be the primary thing that drove my time, like for my entire adult life, 40 hours a week. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I really wanted to go in this direction, you know, I was searching for like, how can I, I, you know, make money, support my family like you do, but yeah. also um, do something good in the world. And at some point I landed on, well, that's either going to be for me because being a doctor was not in the cards. So mm-hmm. um, either nonprofit work or maybe policy work of right. some kind. And right. there is... Um, you know, there was a whole season when I thought it was going to be policy work. I, I was actually a freshman in college when September 11th happened. It is shocking to me that there are adults who were not alive for that. Right, right, <laughs> like, oh, right. where's the time gone? Yeah. Um, but it did, it did a sort of awaken me to the reality that politics does shape people's lives in a way that I never paid any attention to whatsoever as a child or, or a teen. And yeah. so for, for a while, I thought that would be it. And I, and I thought, well, if I'm going to go shape policies that change people's lives, then I better know something about how the world works. And so I, I did do a season of sort of different jobs in different areas, you know, was a paralegal, right. was in PR, did some different things. And then, um, after grad school really found myself called into this world of, of anti-human trafficking work. Right. Um, and it was, I mean, at that point in time, I now people know that human trafficking exists and is a thing. And, and there are many nonprofits and, mm-hmm. you know, at that point in time, every single person who learned about it, myself included, was completely shocked. It was shocking new information. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were, you know, even today, like if I'm in the airport in a bathroom stall, I'll see a little sign yeah. that says, you know, if you are being trafficked or if you're, you know, if, or if you see these signs, then, you know, mm-hmm. here's what you should do. You can say something, you can talk to a professional, whatever. Yeah. That stuff didn't exist. People didn't have that kind of wow. training. The entire tourism and travel industry and has that was been only like 30 trained. years ago, right? That was only yeah. like a few decades ago. Yeah. I mean, let me think. When was that? I was doing that work in roughly 2012. Oh, um, wow. So even, um, you know, more recent than I thought. Yeah, it's a pretty new development. It really is. Um, yeah. And such a such a relief. Like it was such a, it was honestly kind of a scary time to feel like, People need to know about this. This is the most atrocious yeah. thing I've ever heard of. We mm-hmm. all think that like slavery ended 100 plus years ago and it didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And especially when you get into certain aspects of that, um, which yeah. I, I won't get into on this podcast, but it did um, sort of, because I get back to your original question about like the, how it got me here. Yeah, and then how you got into, you know, finance. Yeah, it's a <laughs> it's yeah, a it's pretty a big change. shift, right? Yeah. So I did that anti-human trafficking work for about two years. And during that time, mm-hmm. it became quite apparent to me that you could never solve this problem with 
government dollars or donation dollars. It was at the yeah. time a $28 billion industry. Yeah. Um, you just, there's, there was no match between those two things. And I also realized that a big part of what was happening was groups of people would be unable to meet their own needs because yeah. of economic conditions where they were, and they would become vulnerable to exploitation. Mm -hmm. And, um, any place that you had a group of people who was that vulnerable to being exploited, somebody would come along and exploit them. It was pretty much a guarantee. And it actually, it, it became that light bulb moment for me that actually um, business was never about greed. Right. Business was about human flourishing, that mm. healthy, functioning, just economies where people could get jobs and serve each other and meet their own needs through their own work were an absolutely necessary component for, yeah. for flourishing communities yes. and flourishing humans, in addition to all the other good things that mm -hmm. that businesses do. You know, they we call what they do, we, they provide goods and services. That means they yeah. should be doing good for us and providing services to people being of service, you know? So yeah. it really, it really changed the trajectory of how I even thought about business. And then the next step in my career was at a foundation that was um, in the process of aligning all of its investment portfolio with mm -hmm. its mission, um, yeah. looking at the impacts and the, and the values that were sort of showing up. And I learned so much in that process. And my job was to take what we were learning as a foundation and sort of help make right. it public share it with the world because right. we had the freedom to do that. Um, and so that was the the pathway that led me into finance where um, mm. I loved what I was seeing that you could really shape the world through the values-based use of capital. But it seemed at that point in time that it was mostly available to the very wealthy or to institutions. Right. Right. So I really wanted to find someplace where um, I, I wanted it to be in, you know, mutual funds and ETFs mm -hmm. and things that regular people like myself could invest in. Right. And uh, when I, when I found Eventide, that was what I found. And it was, it was just so thrilling to me oh, <laughs> that wow. I would get to use my skills in support of something like this. Well, thanks for your, you know, overview. I, um, you know, before I ask, you know, how you, you, you made that transition um, into finance, I guess the thing you know in your story that stuck out most is is how you never thought of business you know as a as a vehicle for greed, because a lot of guests who we've who we've have spoken to in the past, they have their story of you know being really greedy at first, um, mm -hmm. about money before you know finally realizing that's not the path forward and they have to you know change course in their life, but for you from a young age it seems you know it, the greed and money wasn't even a factor. So could mm -hmm. you tell us how how you didn't get affected, you know, even from a young age about these worldly views of you know money and, and power and greed? That is a great question, and nobody has ever asked me. Um, and I would say it's probably because I took it for granted. Oh, wow. I, okay. you know, I, I grew up neither wealthy nor poor upper middle class, but in, in sort of a lower middle class, maybe area of the country. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I always had whatever I needed. I always knew my parents were very pro education. And right. so I always knew, for example, that wherever I went to school, they would pay for it. Mm -hmm. Um, or they were, they would make sure it was handled somehow, you know, right. um, I took it for granted that someday I would live in a beautiful house. Like I didn't, occurred it didn't occur to me that anything else would happen so right. I didn't feel that I needed to be greedy about it right wow okay so that is not a particularly um flattering picture of me but, either. but even when you got into the corporate world you still weren't affected you know because you you meet different people and they might have different thoughts about money and power I suppose so but I also you know I I got into the corporate world via the nonprofit world where people very much care and absolutely sacrifice paychecks mm -hmm. for, you know, a paycheck, not far more than paychecks, paychecks yeah. and free time and sanity, emotional yeah. health, all oh, kinds yeah. of things, the the things that people sacrifice for the good of others mm. in, in sometimes the nonprofit world and like so, social services, like all kinds of areas of the right. economy that we take for granted. So even when I was um, interacting with people who had vast amounts of money, the reason we were interacting was because they wanted to do good with it. Right, right. So I guess you had, you know, positive influence from a really young age. And, um, you know, this 
carried you throughout your career and you talked about um you know making the switch from a non-profit world to a completely for-profit world mm -hmm. um, could you tell us how you made this change and any challenges that you faced along the way well i will say that one of the biggest incentives there was that i did completely burn out I was in such a bad place. By the end of 2012, mm. 2013, I was clinically depressed. I had gone through some horrible stuff in my personal life. And right. I'd been spending two years, you know, reading or watching or listening or learning about nearly every day people having unbelievably traumatic things happen to them. Mm. And the, you know, people I would interact with, with at other nonprofits who are more like directly serving survivors of human trafficking, you know, they were even more in the thick of it. Um, and they were very much my peer group, right? So right. I was, I was traumatized and I had never given myself space to acknowledge that because I'm like, well, you know, at the time, like, I'm like, I'm a very educated white woman living in New York City. Like, yes, I don't really have much money. I didn't, I didn't at the time, but I, I've pretty much got everything else going for me. And like, I've never had any of these traumas happen to me. So it's, you know, I'm in the role where I should be serving and I did not sufficiently care for myself. Right. So it got to a point where I recognized that I needed to be in a role, A, where I wasn't being traumatized every day and B, where I was able to actually like, pay for things I needed and save right. for my own future. So um, it's funny because in, in some ways, moving from nonprofit to for-profit work was moving from a place that lacks safety mm. to a place that had safety uh, for me. So yeah, that was, I mean, that was huge. And I mean, just in terms of like fi finding the right role, you know, Mm. Um, that happened almost, I'm, I'm not going to say by accident. I was job searching, but I was also temping and right. I got right. this temp job and mm. I was telling a person at this temp job, you know, he's like, Oh, mm. well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I really want to help people through, you know, allocating capital to businesses that are behaving mm. well in the world. And he was like, Hmm, you know, that's kind of what we do here. I was like, <laughs> right. Oh, you should put that on your website. And then they hired me to be on the communications well, team. So that sounds worked like out. A really, it sounds like a really in easy interview you got. <laughs> Well, I did, I did have to go back for a proper interview, but it was a lovely introduction. And I really, for me, you know, those, those things, um, it can be a frustrating thing to be a young person looking for a job and, yeah. and, and really so much of it is serendipity and like, mm -hmm. I don't know, God reaching in to make yeah. a difference. And that can be frustrating because you don't have control. I could not have set up that meeting. They, they wow. at the time really did not have much of a website. There's no way I would have found this organization on my own, but it was the perfect next step for me. Because it's very, really unusual for somebody without financial experience to be able to get a corporate job in finance, you know, quite. Ah, yeah. now I see what you're saying. Yes and no. I think it's a common misperception that if you're working in finance, you have to be doing um, the financial stuff. But right. I um, never have. I've always been on the communication side in one way or another. So right. at that firm, you know, we we rebranded the firm. We relaunched yeah. the website. We wrote a lot of content. Um, we did a lot of reading also. Um mm -hmm. So, you know, and actually I also, I, I volunteer with an organization called Invest in Girls, mm -hmm. which helps introduce um, mostly like, like low income high school girls to concepts in finance and careers in finance. Mm -hmm. And my big, you know, drum that I'm always beating is you don't have to be good at math or money to get a yeah. job in finance because financial industry requires all of the same things, back office, mm -hmm. HR, um, it just like all, all communications in yeah. all of its forms, graphic artists, it needs the whole yeah. shebang. And so whatever you have, you can do it in finance. I see. I see. So if I can just go back a little bit, when you talked about, um, you know, burning out in the, you know, NGO world, mm -hmm. I think it's quite a common theme um, to have, you know, a lot of people burning out, you know, in the NGO sector. Mm -hmm. Could you really point your finger towards the major reasons why that might be a case or why that might be? your case in particular? I mean, my experience does speak to part of it is people go into that sector because they care about others mm. and even making that first step. And this is true also of professions like teachers or nurses. Yeah. You're going into a profession where right off the bat, you're making a sacrifice of like the money that you could have earned working in finance, yeah. maybe. Um, yeah. 
and or the the time that you spend you know or or your personal um investment like of emotional energy all of that you know you already have a group of people who are going in this direction with mm -hmm. some level of self sacrifice mm -hmm. like just as table stakes mm -hmm. and i think that what i didn't recognize was the absolute necessity of drawing healthy boundaries for myself mm -hmm. because the world does not do that for you yeah yeah. Um, and I, you know, so the, I went to a church at the time that had a, um, a, the motto was joining God in the renewal of all things. Right. And later in life, I adopted that as like my career motto, mm -hmm. because it was a reminder to me that it's not my job to save the world. I am incapable. Yeah. Um, for all of the efforts that I've done, there's very, I don't think I've, I don't think I've saved anyone from anything really. Well, you might have, you might have, you just don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. Yeah. Um, but what I can do is I can join the good work that is already being done. Like I will take upon my shoulders, the work that has been assigned for me to do, and I will leave, you know, God in charge of coordinating it large scale. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it gives me a sense of peace and freedom where before I felt like I had to say yes to every possible opportunity and I, and I wasn't humanly capable of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, you know, the story is that you, um, learned how to outsource, you know, things to maybe other people or maybe to God or would, would you, would I you guess so. Sure? I mean, in a mental sense. Yeah. I did. I mean, I, for one thing, I, I had to, I had to leave that industry. I had to give myself an opportunity. I mean, I was, I was really at nothing in my bank account during that season. There was a day I remember when wow. I went to the grocery store to buy something and I realized like, oh, I've maxed out my credit card. My bank account is wow. overdrawn. And I dumped out the change thingy to go to the laundromat the other day. Wow. I cannot buy anything today. Wow. Now, I was ultimately fine. And as I said, I came from like a very, a comfortable family. Like when mm -hmm. I needed financial help, I was able to call my parents and get it. Yeah. Um, I was, I was ultimately never in like a horrible situation where I wouldn't have had any resources. I'll, I'll go back to the point where you were talking about not having any funds um, in your bank account. Yes. Yeah. So I definitely had... I, I guess you'd say I hit rock bottom at that point. Yeah. I recognized that at this rate, um, the things that I had taken for granted would happen. Mm -hmm. Just being able to pay for normal things, being able to pass on to my future children, the blessing of education, the blessing of education that my parents had given me, like I needed to get that show on the road. And I also oh. needed to be in a space where I wasn't being sort of re-traumatized every day mm. by the work I was doing. Um, and meanwhile, I could see, I think, oh, I think I had a, I had a friend who actually she tempted for the same agency that I mentioned earlier that I attempt for. And yeah. that agency primarily served hedge funds. And this friend of mine, I absolutely love her to death. She mm -hmm. is not the smartest person I've ever been friends with. Right, <laughs> and I was right. like, oh, she's got this amazing job. Why can't you? And it pays <laughs> so much, but right. she could be doing the same thing elsewhere for half that amount of money, but she is doing right. it for a hedge fund. And so she's getting paid really well. Yeah, and yeah. she would tell you all those same things too. Like, I can't believe I get to make, make this much money doing what I do. So, um, that really sort of opened my eyes. About, oh, okay. Maybe I should be looking that in this direction, but really though, I mean, I didn't know what I didn't know at that point. And none of us know what the future of the economy holds either. Mm -hmm. So I thought that it was going to be in the direction of something at the time we were talking a lot about CSR, corporate social responsibility. Right. So I thought I would, you know, for example, one of the places I applied was a consulting and marketing firm that did a lot of CSR reports for companies. And I thought that that was going to be kind of the niche, like, okay, I'll use my my communication skills and I'll do it in this area that I'm really interested in. So I did not know that finance was going to be the area until I stumbled upon this, this philanthropy opportunity. Right. And then, you know, I always just thought of philanthropies as being places that like gave a lot of money away. Mm -hmm. I did not know prior to then that they do a lot of investing. They have a typically an endowment that's yeah. given to them by a you know, wealthy person. And then they invest that money and give away grants out of the profits. Mm -hmm. So actually the, the vast majority of the money that they're handling in any given year is the investment portfolio, not the grant portfolio. Right, right. I see. 
So, you know, even though this is not a religious podcast, but I know that, you know, you, you're from a Christian background. Um, could you maybe tell us a little bit how your, you know, religious beliefs, you know, shapes your career decisions? Yeah. Oh, gosh. I mean, it's kind of everywhere, right? It's it's yeah. whatever our worldview is. It's the water you swim in. It's the air you breathe. So it's a little bit hard to say, well, it was this thing and that thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, first and foremost, it was just the desire to do good in the world. Like I, there are a million verses you could cite about, you know, for example, how every, every good and perfect gift comes from God. Like God is good. Mm -hmm. If God is not good, I mean, people who will end up believing that God is not good are clearly not going to like, where, where, I don't know. Like, um, even if you look back at Plato and he's talking about the form of the good and the form of the beautiful, like there even in this sort of, I guess, atheistic or secular approach, it's still like the search for the good and the perfection yeah. and, yeah. and knowing that I, I wanted to be part of that, whatever brings joy and flourishing and healing and goodness into the world. Like that's, that's what I need to be part of. If I'm yeah. causing destruction and pain, yeah, you know, what is my life even worth? Yeah. 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 So that's fundamental. I mean, and I guess what that is, is love actually. Yeah. Um, I, I have heard it said that there are fundamentally like two things driving everything in the universe, love or fear. You're even either being, you know, driven mm. by love or by fear. And mm. the fear is that like negative that hurts things and people. Yeah. Um, and love is what brings healing and flourishing. Like, it's just so fundamentally good. How could we want anything else? Mm. Well, I, uh, not everybody thinks this way unfortunately um but you know i guess um you know because religion played you know a big part in your life it led you mm -hmm. to maybe different places that you didn't think of and for a lot of non-christians perhaps they think that finance and christianity um, can't be lumped together but this is not the case you know based on your experience oh so, yeah um yeah can you tell us a little bit about what you think um, perhaps you could even talk about, you know, what your firm does, why it's different and how you invest, you know, um, in a way that's, um, you know, biblically, um, consistent maybe. Yeah. Yeah. That, I would love to. Um, so there's, I'm going to borrow a bunch of ideas from other people, but I'll try to cite them appropriately. Sure. So, um, I'll, so first, the first person I want to talk about is Jeff Van Duzer, who wrote a book called Why Business Matters to God. It's mm -hmm. actually quite a short book. It's a very easy, a quick read. And it looks yeah. at sort of the very early origins, the Genesis story, Adam mm -hmm. and Eve and the Garden of Eden, right? The creation yeah. story. And, um, and one of the things that you notice there is that work, first of all, God is a worker. God's mm -hmm. doing the work of creation. It's not happening by accident or as a byproduct. It's mm -hmm. active um, and it's good and it's beautiful and it's exciting and it's abundant. Um, and then God invites Adam and Eve to join in that work. And he sort of resources them with everything that uh, the garden is full of. Mm -hmm. And then um, in these in the, in the, you know, he, he says to, to guard it and keep it, the, the garden, um, to, to fill the earth and subdue it, to multiply. Yeah. Um, and so these things kind of develop into, um, actually it's, it's very subtle, but at Eventide, we tend to categorize our investments as being into things that develop things that sustain or things that restore. And mm -hmm. that those three categories are yeah. essentially matching up with that commissioning service that God gave Adam and Eve to right. develop culture, like take these resources I've given you in their raw form and create new things, yeah. sustain, so so guard and keep, mm -hmm. and then restore to some degree, like healing wasn't necessary before the fall. It became necessary after the fall and sin and death and brokenness entered the world. But then, you know, God has always been a healer and a restorer. So, mm -hmm. so develop, sustain and restore, like, as a, as a general rule, we look to do like invest in businesses that are doing that. Mm. Um, and so that's something I've known for a long time and I always think is really cool and very intuitive to me, but I learned something just this past week from one of our co-founders, um, Jason Meyer, he runs yeah. the Eventide Center for Faith and Investing mm -hmm. and which is, which is kind of, 
I don't want to say it's a nonprofit wing. It is technically a department of eventide, but it's an, it's essentially an educational approach. Like right. how can we really, how can we essentially think through this even more deeply in the way that you ask, what does it mean to apply yeah. Christian values as investors? Right. And um, the thing that I learned from him is this. So this word invest comes from a Latin root word, which means to clothe. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't just mean any clothing. It's the clothing of an office with authority such mm. as a king or a priest, right? Mm. Um, and in, and, you know, or, or it can just be like, like it can just mean putting somebody in office and giving them the authority of this office, right? So um, I'm going to have to edit out my pauses, I'm sure. <laughs> it's okay, no problem. So essentially what he says is that, is, is, when the Bible refers to God's people as a royal priesthood or sort of a nation of priests or, or king, you know, kings and priests, um, what is indicating is that God has invested in us mm. sort of some level of power and authority mm. and responsibility. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite quotes being the Spider-Man one, Uncle Ben saying, yeah. you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's an interesting thing because that means that God is an investor mm -hmm. and that likewise, when we are, you know, acting in our role as investors, we have the, we, we are, we are clothing with, with the authority of our capital. We are, we are sort of taking what authority we have and yeah. sending it downstream to whatever companies we're giving it to. Right. And then that, um, when you think of it that way, you're like, oh, well, are these the companies that God would want to invest in, that God would want me to invest in? Are they behaving in alignment with good values? Are they bringing flourishing or are they exploiting yeah. their stakeholders? Are they providing goods and services that benefit people? Or mm -hmm. that, you know, feed insecurities and, and addictions. Um, and it just, it just brings a whole new weight to that. Mm. So, you know, fi final question before we end, um, you know, for people who are perhaps struggling to find meaning in their work, um, would you have any advice for them? Yes. Um, I think that this is honestly the number one thing that I really want, <laughs> want people to do is to pay attention to the ripple effects mm. and take responsibility for the ripple effects of your life. I think it's very easy to think that beyond my narrow scope of work or influence, that things are not my responsibility. Um, there's, for those who are readers or watchers of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there's this hilarious yeah. and amazing bit where um, there's they have a spaceship. They would like it to be invisible, but true invisibility takes a lot of energy. And so it's much more efficient just to put an SEP field around it. Yeah. SEP stands for somebody else's problem. <laughs> so when <laughs> okay. I mean, it's somebody else's problem, people just won't pay attention. Right. And it's a very efficient nature, way to get people to not look at something. Yeah, It's almost like notice that everything, like just there's an emotional sense and an intellectual sense of taking responsibility. I, mean, right. I can't change the whole world, but I can have better conversations with the people in my life. Mm -hmm. I can, here's what I can do. Oh, and if I do this, then this could happen and this could happen and this could happen. Oh, yeah. if I invest my kids 529 plan into this kind of fund instead of that kind of fund, mm -hmm. then seven steps removed somebody else may not get a cigarette pushed at their seven-year-old in Indonesia. Right, right. It just, That's... it really is meaningful. And the more you pay attention to the ripple effects, the more you realize how much everything you do has power. Well, uh, thanks so much again, Dido, for coming to uh, the podcast. And we hope to have you again soon in the future. Thank you so much.